So it's 1023 on July 20th, 2013. I'm Luana Rubin, and I'm interviewing Ginny Beyer. We're at the Not Fade Away Conference in Herndon, Virginia. Thank you. So we're sitting here with this beautiful quilt behind us, and I want to ask you, please tell us about this. What inspired you to make this quilt? Well, uh, it was a long time. It's a sort of a long story involved in that. For several years, 29 years to be exact, I did a seminar at Hilton Head in South Carolina. And every year we had a theme for the seminar. So my, the staff, many of whom are here today, and who worked with me on that seminar, we would plan some theme that we could just, you know, um, basically discover all year long. We would study it and we would make quilts based on that theme. So this one year, um, we decided our theme would be quilts inspired by floor patterns. And we would look in churches and other places and uh, you would just see all these marvelous tiles and patterns for floors. So that's what our theme was for that year. My husband and I had a vacation planned and we were going to Italy. And I was very much looking forward to going to Venice and going to the St. Mark's Cathedral where I've seen fantastic um, pictures of the floor patterns and everything. And it was a really um, exciting trip for me because I was going with that strict, I, this was in September, and I was going with a strict idea to be inspired to make a quilt off of one of the floor patterns or tiles that I would see that I would make them for that seminar in January. I, I knew I wouldn't have the whole quilt done, but at least I could get the top or get it started or something. Uh, so I got up that morning, our flight was leaving at 5 o'clock, I was really excited, packing my bag, and I got a phone call from a good friend of mine, Bonnie Stratton, and she said, turn on your TV. And it was September 11th. So, Obviously, we didn't go. But um, being in the Washington, D.C. area, of course, you're very much involved. My daughter was in medical school. She, uh, you know, they called anybody who had any medical experience to be on call. Um, I had a very good friend who was in the plane that went into the um, Pentagon. Um, so it was really, um, well, as you all know, it was a hard time. Um, after a couple of days, um, you know, I, obviously we didn't go and we would postpone the trip, but after a couple of days, my husband and I decided we had this two weeks set aside, we ought to just go somewhere and get out of town, because you had, had all of you heard who lived here, the droning of the planes overhead and everything you were seeing, and I thought, you know, I'm not going to make that quilt based on a trip to Italy, obviously, but I had books and I had pictures, and I decided I would do a quilt based on a, inspired by a floor design, and um, I had a poster that had been given to me by a, a woman that had the whole layout of the St. Mark's Cathedral. So I sat down, first of all, on my computer, and I drafted the center circular part, and it was based on one of those ideas. and. I just sort of drafted it on the computer and then I took that basic design and we made a reservation to go stay over at on the eastern shore of Maryland at St. Michael, Michael, St. Michael's. And we stayed there for three or four days and I loaded the car with all the fabrics that I envisioned, that I was seeing that week of after September 11th. You saw the ash and the dust and the, you know, the flags all of a sudden, you know, in that one year, I don't think I've ever seen so many American flags in my life mm -hmm. as I saw that year. So it was the red, white, and blue mixed in with the ash and the dust and everything else. And I just went through my entire stash and just loaded bags of fabric in the car. And I remember sitting there on the floor in the hotel room with my design laid out and fabrics laid out, laying out the individual sections. This is just a section of this center design. Um, I decided that the very center, I wanted to be an adaptation of the um, Statue of Liberty. And I wanted to try to capture the chaos. I mean, I couldn't even imagine all those people standing at the top of the um, Empire State Building looking down and what they had to do. 
And so one of the sites that they would have seen would have been the Statue of Liberty. So I sort of patterned that center off of that, and that's oh. where I started. And the, I had designed a fabric line in 19, well, whenever Columbus, 500 year discovery of America, what was that? <laughs> anyway, uh, and I called it discovery. And one of the patterns, one of the fabrics in that design was a type of twall that had images of different um, things that had happened over the 500 years. And one of those was, I put in there the Statue of Liberty, the American flag, um, various things. I hadn't used that fabric on any quilt myself, but I threw that in the car because I knew it would come somewhere. So I put the Statue of Liberty piece from that fabric right in the very center of the quilt. And then, well, that the rest of the design came later. This, I didn't know where I was going after that center design, and that's the part that I started doing. Um, I wanted to use all only my own fabric designs, so the quilt has fabrics that are only my designs. And that's where it started, and then it just sort of grew. I didn't really know where I was going, but I was just trying to capture just the spinning and the chaos and everything that was going on. My goal was to finish the quilt in a year by the next anniversary. Um, it's all hand pieced and hand quilted, and I did, I, it took me 13 months. Uh, I finished it on October 6th, uh, the following year. And throughout it, I, you have the bigger uh, sort of inspiration from the Statue of Liberty um, with these points sort of coming out. I mean, it's not a literal thing, but that was sort of what I was doing. And I wanted, um, I didn't know what this border would be. I pieced sections of about probably 10 different borders until I came upon the one that I actually uh, was happy with. And then I straightened that out to echo that in the border along the outside edge. There's a real luminous and three-dimensional quality about this quilt, which you're known for, but I wonder if you could make a comment about that, about your technique. Well, it took me, the section I'm talking about is one of these. There's eight of those sections, and it took me probably, it took me longer to select the fabrics and lay out the order of the shading of those fabrics than it did to sew it. Mm -hmm. um, this starts light and goes dark in the in the reds into the purple the background sh starts with a light blue and shades light to dark that way but they also shade sideways light to dark in the reds in the, the background within the section so each one of those sections and I didn't want to repeat the same thing so each one is different but they're all the sort of the same shape and I'm really struck by how you took a straight striped border and made it into a circle yeah, that, <laughs> people always ask me about that, but it's not, it's not as difficult as it looks. Um, this design is based on eight points. You'll see the eight main points in the star. So you imagine eight spokes going out from the center. And then um, and, and that's where you have these eight different pieces. So if you take that basic design and put equal spokes going out from the center, and I did it with eight times two is 16 times two is 32. So there's 32 spokes and what you actually have this this represents two of the spokes in the distance between so I took my center circle measured the width of that border and made another circle that much bigger outside of it and then put those spokes and then cut off the bottom this is actually straight it's not curved just cut off the bottom so each one of those is a little wedge shape uh, and I cut each one centering the flower in exactly the same place in the middle of the wedge and so 32 wedges together. Mm -hmm. Now one of the other things I wanted to do when I started the quilt, I wanted to have a um, one piece in the quilt for each of the victims of the uh, September 11th attacks. And at the beginning the numbers were horrendous. I mean they were horrendous anyway, but they were so much more horrendous. So I wanted to make sure I had all the pieces. So to get enough pieces as you got out to this border, well, plus the fact I just liked it, this, this, this border, and it's a curved border, now we've gone from 32 wedges to 128 wedges. And um, so it's just this little tiny wedge section, but it's made up of three pieces. This border is off of that one, and the center border is off of this one so it was actually the combination so it's 128 times 3 is how many pieces were in that border going around there um, 
was leading to something else I was going to say. Many pieces? Oh, that was it. 4,777 pieces in the quilt. So what will happen to this quilt? What are your plans for the quilt? I don't really know yet. <laughs> I don't know. I'm sure it will come to you. Yeah. Well, thank you. Would you like to tell us about how you started quilting? Who taught you to quilt? Well, I nobody really taught me the quilt. Um, I've been sewing my whole life. I don't remember learning how to thread a needle because I always did it. I don't remember learning how to sew because I always sewed. But I didn't quilt. Uh, kind of like Jeanette was saying, um, I always had projects going. You know, I didn't quilt until I was an adult. I knitted, I crocheted, I embroidered, I did all, all those different projects. And my husband and I and our children, uh, he, my husband got a grant, not a grant, a, a job working for the Ford Foundation. And we traveled to several foreign countries. And one of the places where we lived was India. And um, at that point, towards the end of my stay in India, I had run out of yarn, and I knew you couldn't, didn't bother buying yarn in India because it faded terribly. And um, I, didn't, I ran out of projects. I just decided, I, well, meanwhile, the whole time we had lived there and in Nepal before that, I had become fascinated by the textiles mm -hmm. that they made where they would do the hand block printing of the fabrics and, and I love and, like and the colors and the colors and and I just loved to go to the villages where they would hand block print the fabrics and I would watch them and I would buy the fabrics and so I had this stack of fabrics and it was the fad where you know everybody was making clothes with different kind of patchwork things so I made all these skirts that had Indian fabrics in them I had leftovers and I made tote bags and Pretty soon I had this whole big stack of scraps. And I walked into the uh, commissary one day. We had access to the commissary. I walked into the commissary one day and there was a quilt hanging on the wall. And it was being raffled off for a worthy cause. And I said, um, I took one look at it. Now, you know, mind you, up to that point in my life, I had had no experience with anything quilted other than mattress pads. You know, quilted pad that you put on your that you put on your bed, and this quilt that was hanging there was white, with applique flowers on it, and just parallel line cross hatch quilting. And it's the first time I remember looking at a quilt, really thinking, you know, a quilt, and and. I remember thinking in my mind, that looks just like a mattress pad that somebody stuck flowers on. <laughs> and I further said to myself, if I ever make a quilt, I don't want anybody to think I took a mattress pad and doctored it up. <laughs> so I think that was probably the strongest influence of my quilting career. And today I truly appreciate white on white quilting and, and all of that. I mean, I, I think it's beautiful, so don't get me wrong, but at the time, that's what I thought. So it just so happened a couple of weeks later, we were invited out to dinner at this woman's, um, or one of the couple, another American couple's house, and she had a quilt frame in her living room with a quilt on it that to me looked like another mattress pad. <laughs> and, um, but she explained to me that she would go home on uh, home leave and she would buy these quilt kits that were available. Now, this is 1970, 1972, mm. the Paragon quilt, tip, quilt kits. Mm. And that's what they were. They were white, pre-cut fabrics, applique flowers, and so forth. But she had some quilt books, and she let me borrow a couple of her quilt books. I said, well, maybe I need a project. Maybe I should make a quilt. So she let me borrow her quilt books, which were four or five of those Aunt Martha's pamphlets. Remember all those Aunt Martha's? So and in one of them, there was a um, hexagon template. And one of my McCall's Needlework and Crafts book had a, um, this is all, all this inspiration, so where it came from, it had an advertisement for Stearns and Foster Batting. And uh, it was a full page ad in the magazine. And I think what drew me to the, what drew me to the, ad was not the quilt on the bed, but that it was a canopy bed. And I'd always wanted a canopy bed as a child. <laughs> so, but the quilt on the bed was a hexagon quilt. And th this had gone about six months before I, I met the woman with the quilts. And it had been a grandmother's flower garden quilt. And 
to use up all my little bits and pieces of yarn, I figured out how to change a granny square. Anybody who's into crocheting knows what a granny square was. So I figured out how to change a granny square into a hexagon. And I made afghans of grandmother's flower garden granny squares crocheted together of all my leftover yarns. And it was when that was finished that I thought I'd need a project. So here in this lady's living room, she's got a booklet that has the hexagon and the grandmother's flower garden pattern, and I thought, that's the quilt I'm gonna make. So I, I started that quilt, but I didn't want it to be a mattress pad, and I loved all the Indian fabrics that I had all the pieces of, and so I just started cutting hexagons out of all my scraps. Of course, I didn't have enough, so then I'd go to the village and have to buy more <laughs> fabric. And so, so that was that's really what got it started. And what city was that in? It was in New Delhi. And how long were you there? We were, we were there for two years. Okay. And obviously it's had an effect on you for the rest of your life. Well, you know, that quilt to me was a project. It wasn't, it wasn't something I, you know, all my embroidery things have been projects. I'd sort of explore one thing and then I'd go on to the next thing, you know, just sort of like. And so it was, to me, that first quilt was a project, but I ended up, ended up really, really enjoying the process. It wasn't until, um, probably about 14 years later, when I went back to India, our daughter was a baby when we lived there, and, and I wanted her to experience what her older brothers had seen. So I took a trip back to India, taking my daughter, India and Nepal. And uh, it wasn't until that trip that I realized how much I had absorbed into me from the design and pattern that was everywhere that I'd never really even documented in anything because I wasn't into design or anything, but you know, I took that trip back, and you see, I mean, I, I love borders. Well, why do I love border, border fabrics? It's because the textiles that I would buy in the marketplace weren't sold by the yard the way we have fabric sold today, but they were sold by the piece. Mm -hmm. It was like for a tablecloth or a bedspread, and all of the pieces had a border around the outside edge. Mm -hmm. So that was ingrained in me from the very early age, but then when I went back, and we went to the places where you would see the elephants and ride the elephants, and the elephants had borders printed across the top of their foreheads. Uh, the taxis and the, uh, and the trucks would have borders painted on them. I mean, everywhere you look, the intricate carved uh, wood frames around windows. So that was just ingrained in me, and then, of course, just the color. So I took lots and lots and lots of pictures of, on that trip focusing more on the design because I'd already, you know, was now doing the quilting and everything. As a fabric designer, you're really known for your borders, so I appreciate hearing that detail. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Well, so many quilters use cotton fabrics now, but obviously you started out with something else. Can you talk about the materials that you like to work with now and the techniques? No, no, those Indian fabrics were all hand block. They were all 100% cotton. Mm -hmm. So I've worked with cotton fabrics from the get-go. Right. Yeah. They were handmade as opposed to what's mass produced today that right. most quilters are using. Right. And so what do you like to work with these days? Um, well, I've designed so many fabrics, and I've always made a point that they must be done in 100% cotton. Mm -hmm. That today I just use my own fabrics. Mm -hmm. I've got a, quite a stash. <laughs> 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 well, I'm sure that we would love to hear, I'm sure we'd love to see what your studio is like. Can you tell us about your workspace? My workspace is any clear surface that I have. <laughs> uh, I, have a stu I have a studio. Mm -hmm and you can't even get into it. <laughs> in fact, my, my new puppy, um, he loves fabric, and um, <laughs> he'll, he's tall enough now that he can put his hand, paws up on the counter, and he loves to, I, I went in one day, didn't realize I hadn't closed the door, and there was fabric all over the floor. <laughs> he had just had such a great time getting up there and pulling it off. Oh, yeah. it off so. It's his favorite color. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, so mostly, mostly I work on my kitchen table because that's the one that can be cleared off as quickly as possible. Plus, it's got a great big bay window that I can look outside and see, you know, the flowers and the trees and everything. So the inspiration is important. Yeah. Yeah. The studio is just for storage. <laughs> Collecting junk. <Yeah. laughs> you 
mentioned that you grew up with a needle and thread in your hand, and I wonder if there's any particular family member or friend who particularly inspired you and guided you. Oh, my mother did, definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother, um, we, we were four girls, mm -hmm. and she taught us how to sew at an early age. I could take apart a treadle machine and, mm -hmm. you know, fix it and put it back together again, and um, we made doll clothes, we made our own clothes. but. And all the sewing that I did, and a lot of it was by the sewing machine, um, my most favorite part of any project I had was the hand, hand work at the end, the putting the hem in the dress, or you know, sewing down bias binding, or whatever. I mean, it was the hand work that I enjoyed more than anything. And uh, as I got into quilting, periodically I would try to do something by machine, and I just did not like it at all. So. <coughs> That's why I like to do everything by hand. Is there a piece from your mother that you still own or that you remember that in particular inspired you? Um, my mother, I mean, she, she just did a lot of clothing sewing, and so I, I don't have any of those things left after all this, you know, all this time. Um, I am also wondering if you could tell us what do you think would make a quilt worthy for a museum? Whether it's yours or someone else's, what, what is it that really draws you to say, wow, that is really an icon of a quilt? You know, I don't think I could even answer that question because um, every quilt has its own story. And it's, it's such a personal thing. You look at, um, I, th I think it has to do with the soul of the person who made the quilt, whether it was a 95-year-old person or a five-year-old child. Um, you know, it has to do with, I suppose, the workmanship. Uh, but we certainly we've seen quilts in museums or museum settings that don't have exquisite workmanship, you know. So I, I've never been one to want to judge quilts. I don't like entering quilts in shows that are judged. Um, because I think each quilt has its own special story and uh, you appreciate it for what it is and not for whatever other people judge it to be worthy of. Can you tell us a little bit about the artists who have inspired you? Well, very early on when I um, came back to the States, still working on my first grandmother's flower garden. I would, I just loved it and I got involved in an organization here in Northern Virginia, the Quilters Unlimited. Um, I actually finished my quilt top and I was, needed to know how to quilt it. That was one thing I didn't know how to do, uh, the quilting. And I knew I needed a frame because that woman in India had a frame or a hoop of some sort. <laughs> And I called all around this area to see if there was any store who had any quilting supplies, and I couldn't find one. And finally, there was a store in um, Vienna called Sowers and Reapers. It's not there anymore. And um, I went to that store because they had needlework, needlepoint supplies, but she had quilting supplies. And I went to the store. First of all, I was looking for, because my quilt was navy blue and red and a navy blue solid background. and. I knew I, I, I wanted a navy blue thread. The woman working in the store, this was, a, this was uh, 1973 probably, and because it took me about a year to do the top. And she said, I said, I need navy blue quilting thread. She said, oh, we don't carry you colored quilting thread. Uh, I said, well, why? She said, because if you, we only sell white and off-white. Because if you made a quilt and it didn't, wasn't quilted in white or off-white, um, and you entered it in a competition, it would be disqualified from the color thread. <laughs> so um, I thought to myself, well, I don't, I don't intend to enter it uh, in a competition, and I want a dark colored thread. Because I couldn't imagine how terrible my stitches would be. But that was just kind of an aside. But uh, in the window, there was a little sign saying, anybody interested in quilting, we are going to um, start a quilt group, so uh, we would like to have you join us. So I, I thought, oh good, somebody there will be able to help me understand about uh, how to do this. So um, I went to the meeting, and there were about 12 ladies, and it was really fun to be a, with a group of women who had been doing what I'd been doing for the last year, and were enjoying what they were doing, and it was just very inspiring. But 
you can imagine in 1973 the fabrics that we had available for us. So the quilts were mostly made with the little Ely Walker calicos, solid colors, um, you know, very different. And pretty soon somebody said to me, um, what have you got in your bag? And so I pulled out this flower garden, which was so different, you know, it, it was, it was interesting. And uh, they're all saying, oh, wow, that's um, so different. It's, you're, you're so creative. And I'm going, I am? <laughs> because it was a project, you know, and I was one of the middle kids. I never was the one who got the praise or anything. I always aspired to what my older sister did, or everybody kept talking about my youngest sister and what a great artist she was, which she is today, even yet. But um, so... It, w it was an inspiration, but the one person there that I met at that meeting was Hazel Carter, who, um, and I would say she influenced me more in my quilting than anybody else. Uh, as far as design and go, I never looked at other people's quilts to get ideas because I had my own ideas of what I wanted to do, and it was kind of entrenched in what I think I had absorbed in India and all that. Why is quilt making important in your life? Uh, well, now it's a major business with me. <laughs> no, it's, it's important for many reasons. It's my well-being, and uh, but but basically, and I think it comes back again to um, the idea of doing the handwork. When you can sit and quilt and sew by hand, and it's it's almost like um, a meditation. I've never done meditation. I've never done yoga, but I had a good friend who did. And she said, you've got to come do this. And I said, well, tell me about the yoga. What do you do? And what do you do in meditation? Well, you just sit and meditate. And she kept telling me all the freeing qualities of the meditation and the yoga did for her. And, and I remember thinking at the time, that's what I get from hand sewing and from quilting, but I have something to show for it in the end. <laughs> I think it's a it, it's a huge importance. I mean, you just see gatherings like this, and I have not seen the exhibit yet, but I will see today. Um, and I've heard it's marvelous. But it's I think there's so many aspects of quilt making. Whether you're making something that you want to display, or you're making something for a child or a sick person or whatever. I mean, it's it's the the idea of wanting to do something for somebody else uh, or even for yourself and it has just so many aspects that you can just get wrapped up in it whether it's a challenge from a guild to, to do something and it's fun and, and you just put all sorts of fun things onto it but I don't know what it is but I think it's just the need of creating and I think the nice thing about quilting is even though I think every quilter is an artist, but some people get really kind of intimidated about the idea, look at all these beautiful quilts out here, I, I don't dare try something myself, what can I do? But quilt making lets you be that artist, lets you take it yourself and do what you want and um, not have to, you know, it's, it, it's just kind of freeing, you know, it's, I can't imagine myself picking up a art brush and paint and making out wonderful um, oil painting. And, you know, you can really just do a terrible job, but you can pick up fabric and put something together and make make it wonderful, no matter what skill level you are, and be excited about it. And I think it uh, brings people together for a sense of community and a sense of spirit and wanting to help and so forth. My last question is that Quilting has evolved and changed so much since you first picked up a, a needle and thread that started hand quilting. What do you think about where quilting is today and where it's going? I just think it's amazing, really. What what we see out there, I mean, and the um, directions that people are taking, you know, all sorts of creative ways, doing things a little different. But I still hope, I still hope, and that's why I wrote my book at the end of the 20th century on hand piecing. I would hope that people will still get the pleasure and enjoyment and see um, how much inner soul you can get from just relaxing and not trying to rush through a project and taking up a needle and stitching by hand. Yes, well said. Well, it's 10.53.
I'm Luana Rubin. I've been interviewing Jenny Beyer here in Hollywood, Virginia, and I'd like to thank you so much for your time, Jenny. Thank you, Luana. Thanks.